welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Let's do this. Stay, stay standing. Stay standing. Let's go before the Lord in prayer together today. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, above all others, we honor you as our Heavenly Father. God, maybe we didn't have a good dad. Maybe we did. But God, you are our Heavenly Father. And we honor you today. And we thank you for your goodness in our lives. Lord, today as we approach your word and open it up, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. Truly today, God, we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color, God, from the tall, the short, not none of that stuff matters, Lord. What matters is us coming together and hearing from you. So Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the correction, and the discipline for each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing for ourselves. No, God, we ask it for all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, we love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bible out with me today. If you have one, if you don't, that's okay. Start bringing a Bible, and uh, you can follow along today on the overheads. That's all right. If you have your Bibles, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. The title of today's message is The Edge of Greatness. Next week, this church is going to start the giving phase towards our commitments to pay off the mortgage. And not if... But when we pay off our mortgage, it's going to be a sign and a wonder here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. People are going to hear about it. Maybe you don't know this, but people all over the world are watching what's going on here at this church in this hour. And when this church building is paid off, like I said, it's going to be a sign and a wonder. People are going to hear about it. People are going to be talking about it. And it's going to amaze people, Christian and non-Christian alike. God wants to use a church and a bankrupt city where the people may not be as educated as other places or as cool as other places or as smart or as nice as other places, but God wants to take a people and raise them up and use them to do great and mighty things on the earth. We stand on the edge of greatness. And we see in the word in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, that there was a time when there was a people just like us, people who were impoverished, people who had a recession, something had taken place. There were saints in Jerusalem and in Judea who were in need of relief. They needed finances. So the Apostle Paul and his crew went out and they were receiving offerings from the Gentile churches in better off areas, if you will, in order to supply for the need of the church in Judea. And something took place, something happened. There was a church much like us that didn't have it all. They were more like the have-nots instead of the haves. And even though they didn't really have that much to give, they they wanted to give and, and they desired to give and so they gave. They gave beyond their ability. We'll see this in the Word in a moment. And, and it encouraged the Apostle Paul. So now he comes to another church that, that really was better off than they were. See, there was two areas that we're going to see. One was called Macedonia and one was called Corinth. Macedonia was more of the Greek side of things, and the Greeks, their empire had been raised up and now had been brought low, and now the Roman Empire had come up, and now the Roman Empire was the ruling, reigning, occupying government and authority on the known earth at that time. And so here, Paul is writing to a Roman province of Corinth, and he's telling them some things about what happened in the Macedonian churches. And by comparison and contrasting, he shows them some things. See, these people weren't that well off. These people weren't really, you know, highly regarded any longer. And there was a little bit of competition between these two areas. And so now he's telling the people in the Roman province who were the haves, who had more, who who had more ability, who had more resources, he starts stirring them up by comparison and contrasting with these other churches. Let's take a look at it together in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, he says these words, Moreover, brethren... We make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, let's stop right there. 
See, we could read something like that and we could skip right over what's important in the Word of God. So let's take our time with this section of Scripture for a moment. The grace, the grace of God. He says, moreover, I want to make known to you the grace of God that was bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, in this church, we have a definition of grace. And if you don't understand grace, you won't understand what he's really talking about. How do we define grace? Well, it's grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Now, if you know that definition, let's make it personal and say on my behalf when I can't do it. Let's say it all together. Here we go. Grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Let's say it again together. Grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. So we find out that this is an ability of God. This is a power of God that was bestowed or given or poured out on the churches of Macedonia. Verse number two. He says that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Now, what is he saying there? He says that in the midst of a great trial of affliction, see, something had come upon the earth. There was recession. There was hard times that had come. And in the midst of hard times, they still had an abundance. What was that abundance of? An abundance of joy. They had the joy of the Lord. They didn't care about circumstances and what was going on around them. No, they said, we're excited. We love Jesus. And he says, and in their deep poverty, not just lack, not just need, not just hard times, and not just even poverty, but deep poverty. He says that they abounded in the riches of their liberality. See, they weren't going to let anything hold them back. They weren't going to let circumstances, they weren't going to let pressure or trials or any other thing stop them from liberally giving. That means abundantly giving. That means overflowing, hilarious giving. Now, you say, you don't have anything. How could you give like that? And you kind of start to chuckle, start to laugh. Why? Because it seems ridiculous. And yet they said, we don't care. We've got the joy of the Lord, and therefore, we're going to give, and we're excited about it. Verse number three. He says, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Now, notice he didn't say they were freely giving. He said they were freely willing. Why? Because it starts right here with the heart. It starts with a desire. It starts with a want to. It starts right here with the heart. See, that's one of the great things I believe about this campaign that we've been going through, Freedom for Our Future, is that we found out that there was a couple of freedoms that we needed. We, we needed freedom for the next generation. We don't want to be a one-generation church. We want this church to be here till Jesus comes. We needed freedom for, from financial institutions because the borrower is slave to the lender, and we didn't want to be in that position any longer. Finally, we found out that we needed freedom for more ministry. How much more could we do with the finances that we're pouring into interest and into our mortgage? But the greatest thing that took place in this campaign was when Pastor Jim stood in this pulpit on the first week of the Financial Freedom for Our future series, and said that there was another freedom that would come through this process of money management and capital stewardship, and that freedom was freedom for our hearts. See, this is all about the heart. God is not interested in money. God is not interested in dollars and amounts. No, God could drop $13 million in the courtyard right now. If God wanted to sign a golden check and lay it down on Pastor Jim's desk, he could do that right now. If all it was about was about money, God would have already taken care of it. But it's not about just money. It's about our hearts. And he says, I bear witness that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. That means that they just were overflowing. They were abundant. They desired it. Let's take a look at the next verse, verse number four. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Now, right there, there's a miracle taking place. Did you know that? Because we don't understand this, but that was a miracle taking place. Because I don't know of any preachers right now that are saying, hey, people are knocking down my door to give an offering. That is a miracle taking place right there. Our finance manager is giving a great big laugh on the front row over here. Because I don't think she's received very many calls. I'm waiting to give. I want to give. I can't wait till Sunday. Can I bring it in? You see, that, that doesn't happen that often. We've had some people that have, that have been joyous about their giving. But, you know, most of the time people aren't saying, I'm ready. Hey, I've got, the fine, I'm, I've got my offering. Would you just come and get it already? 
It's a miracle. Imploring us with much urgency. See, they were beating Paul's door down, saying, come on. We've got it. Come get it. We want to be a part of this. So look at verse number five. And not only as we had hoped, I'm sorry, back to verse four, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift, look at this, and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. What does that mean? They said, don't leave us out. We want to be a part of this. We want to be counted among the number of people that gave to the saints in Judea and Jerusalem. When we get to heaven, we want to be a part of that crew that God starts to recount through the ages what took place. And when he says, hey, everybody that gave to the saints in Jerusalem during this time, would you just stand up? We want to be bumping elbows with the best of them, right? We want to be in that mix. We want to be a part of that crew that can say, yeah, we gave. And we were excited about giving. Yeah, we didn't have that much. It may not have been as big as everybody else's offering. But to us, it meant something. And it means something to heaven. Don't leave us out, Paul. Don't leave us behind. Verse number five, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. See, it's not God's will that you just do whatever we tell you to do here at the church. No, God wants you to do whatever he tells you to do. God is saying, I want you to give yourself first to me and then to what's going on here at the church. See, if you're just doing this out of coercion, because some big mouth preacher got up here and started to manipulate you and get money out of you. That's the wrong thing to do. I don't care if you give anything to this church as long as your heart is going to the Lord. Why? Because God will deal with you about what you're to do in your life and in your finances and in your future and in your family and in your business and in every endeavor of life. That's what this is about. Not getting money out of you, but getting the will of God into you and into your life. That's what this is really all about. Verse number six, so we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Everybody say complete. complete. See, Titus was one of Paul's companions. He was a fellow minister of Paul's. He was a pastor, and Paul, in fact, you can read the, the letter that was written to Titus. It bears his name. And so Paul had sent Titus out, and Titus had started talking to them about an offering, and they had desired to do this about a year ago, and now Paul is saying, Titus, I want you to go and complete this grace in them. What does that mean? That means that we could stand on the edge of greatness. We could have all sorts of potential. In fact, we could even have the ability, the resource, and the power of God, the grace of God to do it. And if you never do anything with it, it's worthless. God says, I don't want you to stand on the edge. I want you to launch out. I want you to move forward. I want you to go in. I want you to do it. Not just desire it, but also complete it. God is not just interested in how we start. God is interested in our completion of the will of God for our lives. If you've ever said, God, I I want everything that you have for me. God, I I I want all that you've got for me. Then this is for you. Take a look at the next verse. Look at this. Look at what he says. He says, but as you abound in everything. Everybody say in everything. Everything. Come on, everybody say in everything. everything. See, this was a great church. Corinthian church had it going on. They had miracles, signs, wonders, gifts of the Holy Spirit. They were prophesying. They were speaking in tongues. They had interpretation of tongues. Great things were going on. People were showing up. Uh, you know, they were having the Lord's Supper. Now, they didn't do everything right. You know, they had their problems, but they were going after. They were asking Paul some questions, and Paul addressed those things. And now here he says, you guys abound in everything. Look, what are they abound in? Look at this. In faith. Well, that's a good thing. They were faith-filled people. They believed God. In speech, they were talking it up, talking about Jesus. They had the right thing to say. In knowledge, they knew the word of God. They knew about God. They knew the things of God. In all diligence, they didn't just know God. They were getting after it. They were doing something with it. And in your love for us. See, their motivation wasn't selfish, wasn't self-centered. No, their motivation was love. Love is the supreme power of the universe. So he says, as you abound in everything, in all these areas, look at the rest of the sea, that you abound in this grace also. In other words, don't neglect the ability of God when it comes to your giving. Maybe you've prayed that prayer. You've said, God, I want everything you have from God. Don't 
hold anything back from my life. God, I don't want to get to heaven and find a box that was a gift for me in heaven that I didn't use while I was here on the earth. God, I want it all. If that's your prayer, if that's your cry, you've ever said that to the Lord, thought that, prayed that, listen, then don't neglect this area. See that you abound in this grace also, this ability of God. Thank you for those several weak claps and few holy amens. See that you abound in this area. Also, drop down to verse number 10. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage. Not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago. Now, hold on a second. It's to whose advantage? To your advantage. Now, notice he didn't say it's to the advantage of the saints in Jerusalem. It's to the advantage of the children that are hungry and in need. He wasn't pulling at their heartstrings, oh, you need to give to these poor people. No, he didn't say that at all. He said, yeah, that'll bless them. Yeah, that's the need. Yeah, we're going to take care of that need. But listen, God's the one who supplies all the need. God will take care of that. It's not to their advantage. It's to your advantage that you get involved in this. See, that's really why we as pastors... Are, are so strong on this thing called freedom for our future. Not because we need to pay off the church, even though we do, even though we're going to do that. But listen, God will take care of that. God's going to bring in that, those finances. God's going to bring in those gifts. God will take care of his church. But really, this is to your advantage. Why? Because there's a stigma over this city. There's been things spoken over this city for decades. It's the armpit, Southern California. It's always been like that. It always will be like that. In fact, when we've talked to bankers and financiers and different people that work with money and that sort of a thing, businessmen and women, when we start to mention where our church is at, that we're in San Bernardino, they, they sort of wince. They sort of start to hold back, oh, San Bernardino, well, it's always been like that. You know, it always will be. It's not a great place and not, not a lot going on. And yet, here we are doing this so that we can excel, so that we can have a paid-off building. Who cares? Listen, this is just a building. The real church is sitting in the seats today. And that's what this is about. It's to your advantage to get involved. And that's why we say, everybody, do something. Do something. Why? Because you're going to benefit from it. You're going to get blessed by it. When you start to operate and work in the grace of God, when you give, it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. See, we want you to prosper. We want you to be blessed. We want you to rise above that poverty mentality. We want you to rise above the stigma and the things that have been spoken. We want you to be a witness and a testimony to a lost and dying world that there is a God and his name is Jesus and he will take care of his people. <laughs> to your advantage. Verse number 11, but now you also must complete, everybody say complete. complete, the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. See, God's not after what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. God says, start where you're at. Start right now. Start here. Now, I don't think anybody in this room is saying, oh, we shouldn't do this. This is not the right thing. This is not the will. No, we all say, yes, amen. We need to do this. We understand the purpose. We understand the vision. We need to do it. And all of us in this room, if I asked, how much would you like to give? Well, we would all say, well, I'd like to give the $13 million. I'd like to be the dude or the, the dudette, right, that, that could just slap that on the church. I'd feel good about that, but I can't do it. And so what happens? We don't do anything. I could say, well, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to give something? Yeah, I'd like to be the guy that gives, you know, $100,000, but, but, but I can't. I don't even make that in a year. So what happens? We don't do anything. Well, well can't you do something? Well, I would really love, Pastor, to give $1,000, but that's just not in my budget. Can't do it. And so we don't do anything. But God says, this is not about what you don't have. Yeah, we know there's a desire. You want to. You're standing on the edge of greatness saying, I would love to get in there. I would love to do that. I would love to be a part of this great move. But we don't think we have anything, so we don't do anything. But God says, there also may be a completion out of what you have. What do you have? Where should you start? What's in your hand? What do you have right now that you can honor the Lord with? Maybe, maybe, maybe what you have is some extra effort, some extra time. That you can give and make some money. Set that aside for the things of God. 
Maybe you can believe God. I could, say, I, I could give $100 over the next three years. You start putting your hand to something. You collect the junk that's up in your house. You have a yard sale, and you make half of that. And then you have a bake sale, and you make the other half of that. And within one week, you've made $100. And you say, well, wow, I, I made $100. That's cool. See, what do you have right now? Maybe you can abstain from something. Maybe you can set aside the money from there. See, it's not about what you don't have. This is about what you have. God says, don't just desire it. Get in there and do it. Complete the work. Complete the desire. Finish that work. God wants us to start, yes, but once we've started, his focus shifts to how we finish. God is looking at whether or not we complete this. And remember, God's not leaving us alone in this. God doesn't say, oh, hey, here, kid, you're on your own. No, God's right in there with us. Remember that this is a grace, an ability of God that has been given, imparted, bestowed upon us. And so God is right here in the mix with us saying, come on, child, you can do this. You can go for it. You can be a part of the move of God. There in 2 Corinthians, turn a couple books over to Philippians. Past Galatians, Ephesians, find Philippians, first chapter, great verse, a verse that we often find in connection with salvation. We say, oh, yeah, God's going to take care of me until the day I go to be with him or until he comes. And, yeah, God's, God's going to do that. And we understand it in that way. But take a look at it with some new eyes today. Take a look at it in context of what we're talking about. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. Let's read it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this. It says, being confident. Everybody say confident. confident. Now, you didn't sound very confident. Okay, come on. Being confident. Everybody say confident. confident. There you are. There you go. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So what is the good work that God has started in you? See, God has started a capital stewardship campaign here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. God is the one that placed that desire inside of this church, and now it's inside of your hearts. And he who began the good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. See, God will make sure that it comes to pass. God will make sure that those godly desires will happen. Why? Because if we commit our way to the Lord, and whatever we desire, the Bible says that God will delight to give those things to us as we delight ourselves in the Lord. God will give us the desires of our hearts. Recently, I was praying about a decision, asking God to bless something, in fact, and, and I wanted, I had a desire not just to do what I had in my hand. I, I knew what I had in my hand. I said, God, here's what I'm going to give towards this thing. But God, over and above that, I have a desire to give more. And so I started praying, Lord, with this, this area of my life, I want you to bless this area of my life. I want you to bring extra income so that I can double my commitment. You know, I, I really want to go after this thing, God. And so I started praying that God bless this. You know, you ever prayed that prayer? Okay, am I the only one? I, I mean, I, I know oftentimes I kind of put the cart before the horse and just, God bless this. Now, I don't think that's too bad because I know God is pleased when we get in faith, when we believe God, when we do something, we launch out, and God's saying, all right, cool, hey, here we go, you know? And so I'm praying, God bless this. Not necessarily bad, but maybe, maybe I needed to, you know, put things in order and ask God, is this what you want me to do? Now bless this, you know? So that's sort of a thing. So I started talking to my wife. We were talking about some areas of our life. And we said, you know what? We really need to pray in these areas, find out what the will of God is. We need to find out about this and that. And this area came up that I was asking God to bless. And I said, well, you know what? We need to ask God if that's really what he wants us to do. And if so, how does he want us to do it? And then we can move forward with that. And so we're, we're praying about it and, and believing God. And last Wednesday night, we had a great message about the arm of the Lord. Maybe you were here and you heard about that, the arm of God rather than the arm of the flesh. I'm getting excited saying, yeah, the arm of God, God's grace, God's going to do it, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. So afterwards, we had this celebratory time where we're singing that song, Strength Will Rise, as we wait upon the Lord. And so I'm just praising God over there, doing my little dance and my little jam and all that kind of stuff. And as I'm dancing, I just had that area of my life come up. And so I said, well, hey, I'm in the presence of God. I'm in his house. God, what do you want me to do? You want me to do this? God spoke two words to my heart. And I knew as soon as he said these two words what he meant. God said, go up. Go up. I knew exactly what that meant. See, I'd been studying the life of David, and David had hit a low point in his life. He'd been running from King Saul who was trying to kill him. Some decisions that he made affected other people and cost them their lives. And, and, and he even had humbled himself and made himself like a madman in front of his enemies. Spit all over his beard and all that kind of stuff. And so here he is with a band of misfits. He's got one priest with him. 
And he hears that the Philistines, the enemy, are going to be in a certain place. And so rather than standing on the edge of greatness, he's launching out, he goes to the Lord. He says, I want you to bring the ephod, the, the linen garment of the priest, and I'm going to pray and inquire of the Lord whether or not I should go and attack the Philistines. And so he brings it and he prays to God, and God says, go up, for you shall surely overtake them. Listen, church, if you've had a desire in your heart to do something, then the Spirit of the Lord is telling you today, go up, for you shall surely overtake them. Yeah, it's going to be a fight. Yeah, it's going to be a battle. But listen, a great victory will be won as you believe God and as you go up. <laughs> See, last year in 2012, we as a church shouted. We as a church shouted. And now we are believing in 2013. And now God is saying, faith without works is dead. Go up, church. What you're believing me for, go after and do it. So how do we do it? Ah, glad you asked. First Corinthians, if you will. First Corinthians. You guys still okay? First Corinthians, chapter number 16, right at the end of First Corinthians. Apostle Paul's writing about this same collection. Remember, he said, you, you desired to do this a year ago. So he's giving some instructions about it. First Corinthians, chapter 16, verse number 2. First Corinthians, chapter 16, verse number 2 says this. He says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. Storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Now, we could read over this verse and just read right through it and think, oh, that's just instructions on how to give. But I find five principles in this one verse that we're going to run through real quick before we conclude that will show us how do we do this? How, how do we go up? How do we prepare? How do we get a hold of this thing? How do we do this? Okay, notice what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 2. The first thing he says is on the first day, on the first day. The principle here is make this a priority. Make this a priority in your life. Keep it in front of you. You know, we've provided all sorts of materials, buttons and magnets and all sorts of stuff, little cards that you can fill out, uh, testimonies and different things like that. And so make sure that this stays in front of you. Remember how much you committed to. Remember what you wanted to do. And make this a priority in your life that, hey, I'm giving myself to the Lord, and now God is moving in this church in this way, and I need to get involved in this. Everyone can do something, so prioritize it. Listen, we're going to bug you with this. I'm just letting you know right now, after next week, you know, when we bring our first fruits, the first part of our giving in towards this campaign, then after that, we'll go back into the book of Hebrews, but we're going to continue to talk about freedom for our future for the next three years, okay? At Christmas time, we're going to celebrate... Jesus, the baby in the manger, and talk about freedom for our future, okay? At Easter, we're going to celebrate the risen king and talk about freedom for our future. It's always going to be in front of us. We're going to have signs and banners and, uh, you know, freedom shouts and testimonies and websites, and we'll bug you on Facebook and Twitter about it and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because we're making it a priority. This is something that God wants done, and it's to our advantage to prioritize this and put this. So he says on the first day of the week, Next thing he says is, let each one of you lay something aside. What does that mean? That means plan. Lay something aside. Find out what you can do. Plan it out. See, if you fail to plan, then you've just planned to fail. I like what Pastor Jim's dad used to tell me. He said, make a plan and work a plan. See, nothing's going to get done unless we actually give some attention and some interest, some time, and plan this out. And then he says, storing up. Storing up. What does that mean? Prepare it. Start to do it. Start to implement it. Start to do what it is that you want to do. Prepare. And then he says, storing up as he may prosper. As he may prosper. What does that speak to? That speaks to our potential. Do you know that as you start with something, I mentioned, you know, maybe you could give $100. Maybe you could believe God for $100 over the next three years. Maybe that's something that's a large amount to you. That's okay. Start somewhere. Believe God. And like I mentioned, maybe, maybe you said, well, I'm, I'm not going to go to that four bucks place anymore. I'm going to go and, and just, you know, brew at home and save that money, that four bucks a day, and I'll set that aside, and, and I'll store that up as I may prosper, you know, and I'm going to build that up and just drink coffee at home. Maybe you're going to have a bake sale or yard sale. And within one week, let's say God brought you all the money that you needed for your commitment. $100 came into your hand in one week. And you said, wow, it's only been a week. God, I've, I've still got months, years left. She said, I'm going to make a new commitment, but I'm really going after this. I'm going to believe God for $1,000. And 
and you continue to do, and as you may prosper. See, you started somewhere, you sowed, now you reaped, and now here you are wanting to sow again. You've got a desire. You've got a greater desire, though, now. You've got an increased capacity. And you're saying, now I'm believing God for $1,000, and so you start to do your thing. Maybe there's an asset. Maybe you sell a car. Maybe you have something. And within the next year, you've made $1,000 that you've been able to bring into the house of God for freedom for our future. You say, well, I still got two years left. Well, I can believe God for another $2,000 over the next two years. See, now you didn't just give the $100 that you thought you couldn't do. Now you've given $3,100. Why? Because you have prospered. Your potential has increased. Are you listening today? I believe that as we go through this campaign, that people in this church are going to rise up, that they're going to be getting the raises and bonuses, that they're going to be getting the jobs and the better jobs that we've been declaring, that they're going to prosper, and that God is going to bring such increase, that there will be so much abundance that we won't just reach $13 million, we will far exceed the need, we'll be able to build, be able to grow, and we're going to reach this inland empire for Jesus. Then look at what he says, that there be no collections when I come. What does that mean? That means present. Bring it. Bring it. Do it. Don't just stand on the edge of greatness. Don't just stand on the side of the pool sweating. Jump in and get wet. Come on, let's go for it. Let's get refreshed. Let's do the will of God for our lives. So what does that say? Priority, plan, prepare, potential, present. Five things that we see in that verse. Priority, plan, prepare, potential, present. That's how we're going to do it. We'd like to close with a story from the book of Joshua. You want to turn there with me. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter number 6. Here, Joshua and the children of Israel standing on the edge of greatness. They've had some great victories in the wilderness time. They've, they've done some great things. That's all in the past now. They've crossed over and a miracle's taking place. The Jordan River has parted just like the Red Sea and they have crossed over ready for war. And now they're getting ready for their first battle. And their first battle is Jericho. Jericho is a walled city. Jericho was a mighty city, impenetrable. Jericho was like the crown jewel of Canaan. Here they are coming up against this massive walled city. The heart of the people is melted like wax. They know that God has given them the city. And yet God says, I want you to do something here. You're going to have a great victory. You're going to have a great battle, but I want you to do something. Here they are standing on the edge of greatness. And here's the Lord's instructions to Joshua in Joshua chapter 6, verse number 5. He says, it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Now, you remember the story here, Joshua, and then the children of Israel, they marched around the city one time for seven days. And on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. And so he says, it shall come to pass, now that you've marched around it seven times, when they make a long blast of the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up. Every man straight before him. What does that mean? That means that last year we shouted. This year we're believing God. It's laid down flat in front of us. And now every man needs to go up straight before him. God's not asking me to do what you're going to do. God's not asking you to do what I'm going to do. God's not asking you to do what they're supposed to do. No, each and every one of us get involved right where we can. We do our part. Every man straight before him. And that's going to get the job done. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big shout today. Hallelujah. Hey, I want to talk to some of you guys. For those of you that got up and left, I want you to stop there in the foyer, stop there in the breezeway, stop in the bathrooms, finish your business there, and then come out in the foyer and stop and listen. I want to talk to you guys. And for those of you that are here, thank you for staying. I want to talk to you guys too. Thank you, first of all, for allowing me to speak that word into your life. I really do believe you got something from the word of God. Let's not stop there. Let's make sure that before you leave this place that your heart is right with God. That if you died, you wouldn't go to hell, but you would go to heaven. Now, a lot of times people say, well, I don't believe in hell. I'm going to go to heaven because I don't believe in hell. Do you know that the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament? Jesus spoke about it. It's a very real place. Just by denying its existence doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to face the reality. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven and not go to hell? Sometimes people say, well, I believe I'm going to go to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. As long as you hold to whatever truth you, you have, you know, God sees that and he honors that and lets you into heaven. God's a God of love. Well, yes, he is, but did you know God's also a God of justice? You think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, says, oh, whatever you want to do or whatever you want to do, just do your thing and stay true to yourself and I'll just let you into heaven because I love you? Or do you think a loving God who sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, who died a brutal death, 
for us? Do you think that he just leave it up to whatever we want to do? Or do you think that he has a way to heaven? Well, he does. He outlines it for us in his word. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. You've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. Got to get there God's way. Now, oftentimes people hear that and they say, well, that's cool because I've been a really good person. Done a lot of good things. Used to be bad. Cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. I'm going to get to go to heaven just because I've been a good person. Been nice to my neighbors. Gave money to charities. That sort of a thing. Been really good. Maybe you were raised in church. Parents tell you you're a Christian growing up. Went to religious classes. Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Not really born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. Right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough. Not going to make it just by being good. Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Can't get there by your own goodness or by being raised in church. By doing what's acceptable to our society. And that sort of a thing. Not that you do more good than bad and that if the good outweighs the bad, God says, oh, well, you know, they tip the scale. They get to go in. No, it doesn't work like that. It's not what this is about. Nowhere in the Bible do we see that religious activity, being raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, go to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be born in America, or that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. In other words, you're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven. Today, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Now, sometimes people say, well, not only when I was a child did I do those things, I'm here in church in front of you right now, pastor, doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? No. To tell you the truth, no. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, just by sitting in church service, call yourself a Christian, you're not going to make it. That's like me going to my garage, sitting in my garage, calling myself a car, and thinking that's going to make me a car. Mm -mm. Not going to make it to heaven just by sitting in church, call yourself a Christian. Sometimes people say, but I've gotten involved in my last church, sang in the choir for a number of years, helped the pastor out, carried his Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I taught in the Bible classes, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Could you, could you just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven? It, it doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible say church involvement gets into heaven. God's not looking for your membership card to a church, seeing what sort of activities you did before you can enter the gates of heaven. Come on, let's talk because this is your eternal life at stake. Sometimes people say, but I know God. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I know God? I mean, I, I celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life, sing the songs. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. It's great. I'm glad you can do those things. But just, just show that to me in the Bible, could you, where you know who God is, celebrate a holiday, or can quote some scriptures. That gets you into heaven. See, it doesn't work like that. How do I know that? Because if you'd read your Bible, you'd know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day who was a good guy, did a lot of good deeds, raised up in his church, got involved, could quote the scripture. Hey, he could sing the scripture. Yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, hey, man, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, it hasn't changed for us today. If you want to go to heaven, deny your presence in hell, you must be born again. Now, I know we don't like that because we've seen Hollywood movies and television shows and read books about weirdo, crazy Christians that are born again, and we don't like that label. And yet, let's not define being born again by what the world says. Let's define what being born again by what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic, gross, descriptive words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not 
everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, your call, your choice. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, here's your opportunity. I'm going to count to three in a moment, just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. Let's get over that today. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe and friendly church service like this than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on, no one's that dumb. Yet the devil thinks you are. That's why he's telling you not to do this right now. Flesh is trying to hold you back. But the reason why I'm pushing you so hard is because I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I want to see you in heaven and not go to hell. So today, come on, let's push past that. Let's give God all our heart. Let's give God all of our life. See your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, better than going to hell. Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today you can make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given him all your heart and your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand in this place? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God simply raising your hand. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online around the world, God's watching. You can raise your hand right now. When I count to three and pop my hands together, and then if you're in the Love Rock telling Usher, if you're in the foyer, come into the church service. If you're online, click the blue button that says respond to God. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six. Thank you. Anybody else? Seven. Thank you. Eight. Got you right there. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Up on top. Nine. Thank you. Gotcha. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Nine wise people already. Ten up on top. Gotcha. Thank you. Eleven down here. Gotcha. God bless you. Who else today on this Father's Day want to give the Heavenly Father all of your heart and all of your life? Anybody else real quick? Best gift you could ever give God, by the way. He wants you. Anybody else? You know you need to do this. Come on. Go for it. I'm going to give you another opportunity. I'm going to look through the crowd if that's you. When I'm looking your direction, thank you in the family room. Twelve. Anybody else real quick? Over in this section in the middle. Come on. Anybody up on top? Anybody on this side over here? Come on, just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Over here, anybody real quick? Just come on, you're saying, I need to do this. I should do this. I really should. Come on, go for it. Go for it. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Last call. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. There's a dozen wise people already. Come on. Come on, come on. If you're sitting there wondering if you should, you should. Up on top, thank you, got you. 13, who else today? 14, 15, oh, I just feel you out there. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, real quick, real quick. Come on, come on, thank you, 14, 15. We're waiting for you. Is that a hand? No, anybody else? Real quick. Gotcha, 15, God bless you, man. Hey, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, all 15 of you, or if you're number 16, number 17, 18, 19, 20, you should have raised your hand, but you did not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. As we do that, I wanted you to get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, you come. No one leaves during this time. You let them come. Come on, let's stand and welcome them. Just make your way to the front right now from the family rooms. Bring your children. Come on, come on, come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You can come too. You can come too. Come on. Make your way to the front right now. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. Come on. There's room for you. Come 
Everybody else, come on, come on, come on. Make your way to the front. Come on, let's encourage them. They're still coming. You can come too. Just make your way to the front right now. Come on, come on, come on. All right. Hey, everybody up front, look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. You came to give God all of your heart. You came to give God all of your life. All right. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel over here in the black coat. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Okay. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you've already got past me, and this is about as weird as you're going to encounter today. He's cool. Nothing weird is going to go on. He's going to pray with you. Simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free stuff. A couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. You heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, that sort of a thing? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Listen, it's easy, it's free, and you need to do it. Then he'll let you come right back out into the church service. Now listen, give us one year of your life here at this church. I promise you that at the end of this year, that if you come and sit under the Word of God, 12 months consecutively, consistently sitting under the Word of God, at the end of that year, you're going to be so blessed that you're going to say, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.